Um, as the chairman said, my, my name is Martin Kerr. I come from the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. And if you don't know it, essentially it's very simple. It does what it says in the tin, energy studies. We do it, though, from a social, political, economic perspective rather than a technical one. Um, so a lot of what we do is to look at, at policies. And my subject today, as uh, the chairman has said, is a little bit provocative. Europe's energy and climate policies coming apart at the seams. But I, I think it does reflect quite an important underlying tension, I mean, a very fundamental tension, which is what I want to talk about. The, um, what my talk's going to be uh, split into three separate parts. Firstly, essentially an overall EU um, energy and climate policy overview. What, what are the challenges? Now, I assume some of you will be rather familiar with this general picture, so I will probably keep that relatively brief. Um, but my thesis there is going to be that there are two broad sets of challenges. One is to do with the European Union itself, to do with the governance of the European Union, to do with the, the difficulty of getting sensible policy across Europe, particularly, I think, in relation to energy. But the second um, is to do with a slightly different area, which is to the second half of the, 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 the topic, about how do you reconcile climate policy and liberalised markets. And I think there are some rather fundamental difficulties there which are quite difficult to grapple with. And my main thesis is that the Commission, understandably, is trying to cope with the first set of problems. How do you get sensible policy within the EU? Most member states at the moment are trying to grapple with the second set of problems. How do you reconcile climate policy and liberalised markets? and market operation. So they're really trying to do rather different things. And it's not surprising, in my view, that they're not really succeeding in getting a sensible outcome. I'm going to look at that general thesis by reference to uh, electricity market design across the European Union. That's going to be a bit more technical for those of you who are not electricity specialists, but then to lead to the conclusion about what I think needs to be done. Firstly, as I say, what are some of the practical complications for the European Union in reaching um, sensible policy. It's not so much the overall policy objectives that the EU's got in energy. They're essentially the same as every government's. They're called, well, it depends which country you're in, often called the three E's. It's to do with uh, the economy, with the environment, and energy security, reconciling these. Now, the EU objectives are essentially the same, but it does face a number of complications. Firstly, for the EU, the economy part of it is represented essentially by the single market, but that's difficult. Energy, as you probably know, has been a late starter in EU terms. The energy market is still not really a single market. It may or may not get there next year. But um, it, there is a, another fundamental problem there that uh, the, the treaty basis is such that member states still control their own energy mix. Now, whether you can have a single market along with member states in charge of their own energy makes it, to me, an open question. But that is a very difficult set of problems to, to, to reconcile. And as I say, one can understand why the Commission has been spending so much time trying to get to grips with that set of problems. Um, climate change, which is probably the most important environmental problem, it's um, more, there is a more of an EU structure there in the sense that uh, there are overall <coughs> goals across the European Union. But... Underlying those are different carbon and renewable targets for every member state. So again, you've got more diversity, I would say, than unity on this. Um, energy security, the third of the objectives. Again, everyone agrees on the overall objective, but the fact remains that um, as far as the network industries in particular are concerned, regulation is still at national level. There is in the EU nothing equivalent to the, to the uh, US Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, a body which has real power across um, state borders. It's more a matter of the, either the Commission or the regulators amongst themselves. So there are a big governance problems across the EU. So if I think the Commission hasn't solved all these problems, I'm not really blaming it for a failure. I'm just pointing attention to the difficulty of the challenge. Just to give some simple pictures of some of the diversity that um, comes out of this, here is a an indication of the level of support in different countries for different renewables. You can see both that the total level of support 
Well, maybe you can't see because it's a difficult chart to see, but I don't need to go into the detail. The picture is that some countries like Finland offer hardly any support for renewables because they don't really need to. Some countries like um, Germany, say, offer, or France offer very significant levels of support. But the balance of support for different sorts of renewables, the level of support is very different. And they involve, in some cases, quite significant proportions of the market. So in Germany, about 15% of electricity already gets support. In Spain, nearly a quarter of electricity is supported by renewables schemes of one sort or another. It varies between countries, but of course, for all countries, under the EU's 2020 target, this proportion that is supported outside the market is going to increase. So that's one of the, the difficult starting points the Commission's got. But there's a second set of problems um, and I'll, I'll start by going into them at a slightly theoretical level. Um, the problem with reconciling markets and environmental policy arises from the fact that they tend to be framed in different ways. Markets are not about outcomes. They're about setting frameworks within which the market will produce whatever outcome um, market forces determine. And in the small print, which you may not be able to read there, there is um, the original statement from Nigel Lawson in the UK as to why uh, liberalisation was taking place in the UK. It's because he said he didn't see the government's role as being to determine the future shape or to plan the future shape of energy production and consumption. What it should be doing is setting a framework and letting all that be determined by the market. But environmental policy, at least to date, has always been framed in terms of outcomes. It's always been framed in terms of targets, targets for renewables, targets for carbon emissions, targets for just about everything. Uh, I won't be going into the theory of it. At some level of theory, you can reconcile this via economic instruments, but all I would say is at the moment that in practice, um, that's not the way environmental policy works. It works in terms of targets. I doubt in theory whether it could work that way, which we could discuss later if you want, but that is not what happens in practice at present. But the second set of problems, which um, I think not all concerned have grasped properly, is that if you are serious about climate change, it takes priority as far as energy is concerned. And again, in small print, the little quote there that, um, from a report in the UK which says that where energy policy decisions involve trade-offs, then environmental objectives will tend to take preference over these other objectives. Now, the problem is most policymakers don't like that situation. They all stand up and say it's all about a balance. We've got to balance the energy and the environment and the economy. But if you're serious about the environment, that doesn't apply. The environment has to take priority. And the reason is simple, that energy is where the carbon is. If you want to reduce carbon emissions, you have to do something within the energy sector. And that's not the case for these other objectives. If, for instance, I mean, just to take an example, if you have a high carbon tax and you're worried about the social outcomes, well, you can probably deal with those in some other way by direct subsidies to consumers affected or whatever. If you're worried about the outcomes, economic outcomes in terms of competitiveness, then you can reduce taxation elsewhere and so on. Um, you can do things outside the energy sector to deal with the other problems, but the only way of achieving the environmental objectives is within the energy sector, so they have to take priority. And that's something that, as I say, politicians find it very difficult to, to come to grips with, but um, which is very important as far as the uh, subject we're on today is concerned. Now, I've put a little chart here which um, is just dealing with the UK, and there's no special reason for that, except that I know more about the UK than about other member states. Um, my, my argument here essentially is that in grappling with the problems I've mentioned, the, Euro the e European Union is about 10 years behind the curve um, in actually dealing with some of these fundamental problems. Um, it was slow in a way, compared with some other countries, into liberalisation. I've got there 1986, <coughs> and the first major liberalisation um, measure in the United Kingdom, 1996, the first liberalisation package in the EU. In 1998, you had full energy market liberalisation in the UK, about the same time as a third energy package in the EU. But the other thing that happened, of course, in 1998 was the Kyoto Protocol was agreed. And since then, 
an awful lot of thought in member states like the UK and Germany and there are others have been aimed at saying how do you resolve this market that you've now set up, um, how do you reconcile that with these climate objectives we've set up. And the UK has been through a very considerable process um, of, I won't go through all the details, but for instance coming up with 2050 scenarios, how much can you actually reduce emissions by by 2050, um, which underlies the present policy which is about equivalent to the EU's 2050 Energy Roadmap, which came out in 2011. Uh, an outcome of those um, scenarios in the UK was firstly a Climate Change Act, which um, requires by law that these targets be met, which is actually quite important. And secondly, the setting up of a Department of um, Energy and Climate Change. And I think for the reasons I've given, if you're going to take climate change seriously, that's what you have to do. You have to see energy and climate change together in a single organisational unit. Now, I haven't put all the steps on the EU side here, I haven't sort of put the 2020-20 agreement in, but I focused on the right-hand side on the rather minimal moves they've made on that front towards reconciling energy and the environment. There's a 2012 meeting of EU energy and environment ministers. They hardly ever meet together, and there was no meeting of minds, as I'll show on that occasion. And then... This year, the European Council discussed energy, but it didn't discuss the environment. It just discussed competitiveness. It said, well, um, we'll look at the environment some other time. But I think that doesn't work if you're serious about climate change. You have to look at energy and the environment together. This, um, I won't read it all out, but I, 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 think it, I find it slightly amusing. This was described as good background reading by the, the, the then presidency for the 2012 Energy and Environment Ministers' Meeting. And it's, it's quite amusing in a way. It draws attention to essentially the same two problems I've drawn attention to. There is a problem in Europe of targets without governance. It comes up with all these targets, but it's got no way of delivering them. Um, and there are two underlying problems. One is uh, it says there that the consensus that climate change policy should determine energy policy is eroding. I'm not sure there was ever a consensus on that in Europe. But as, as I've said, you have to start off in that way if you're going to be serious about climate change policy. And secondly, um, at the bottom, that member states um, haven't accepted that there will need to be a major curtailment of, energy policy, of their national sovereignty over energy policy. So you have two, two big problems here. And as I say, I'm not really trying to blame the Commission for the, the lack of overall progress. These are some of the fundamental underlying problems it's facing. Uh, this was the outcome, which I find very peculiar, of the 2012 Energy and Environment Ministers meeting. First of the energy ministers agreed in three options, no regrets options, energy efficiency, renewables and energy infrastructure. They didn't really meet the environment ministers. The environment ministers, however, had a lunch where they talked about this, and they said it was very good, and they agreed that the ETS was the cornerstone of their policy. So there you've got the energy and environment ministers not really meeting, coming up with two different sets of policies, and actually, if you look at them, none of them are remotely up to the scale of the problem. So it's not a very <laughs> encouraging start. Um, the Commission sort of half accepted that. In their green paper on the 2030 framework for energy and climate policy, they admit failings in four areas. One is uh, the management challenges of renewables. Another is the incentives to invest in infrastructure. Another is the ETS simply not working. And finally, energy efficiency targets not being met. And if you look back at the previous list of four measures which were <laughs> discussed at the 2012 ministers meeting, it's in exactly those four areas that the Commission admits that things aren't really working very well. Um, so it's slightly strange that they didn't do a more fundamental rethink at that stage, but, but went on to uh, essentially say we need more of the same. Now, I'm going to change, as I say, for the second part of my talk to looking at electricity market design and the challenges posed by decarbonisation. Um, and the first set of challenges, which I think have been fairly widely recognised, is a security challenge that they, they pose. Um, it's because most of the low-carbon plant being supported are intermittent renewables. Uh, they get priority in dispatch. They reduce the load factor for, dis for uh, dispatchable generation. They create market volatility. The numbers there were numbers from a UK uh, study which preceded electricity market reform in the UK because the government asked some consultants, with a high wind power system, 
could the market as it's currently constructed still work? And they said, well, yes, in theory, but in order to get the right amount of investment, you would have to have prices in this range from minus 50 pounds per megawatt hour to 8,500 pounds, which is a, a fantastic range. <laughs> the, the negative prices, by the way, are because um, the renewable plant gets support. In those days, it was from the uh, renewables obligation scheme. So even with a negative price, they would still continue to operate. And much nuclear plant would still operate even with a negative price because it's expensive to turn it off and on. So there would be quite considerable periods of negative prices on their modelling, about a third of the time. The only way in which fossil plant could actually cover its costs would be if there were also periods of very, very high prices. And that 8,500 is very, very high. I mean, the price in the UK just now is about plus 50 pounds. So 8,500 is extraordinarily high. Um, it's not just high, it's got two problems. One is it's quite difficult to rely on. It depends on the precise way the system's operating. But it's also very difficult to guarantee that the government won't intervene. Because if your short-run marginal cost of production is going to be about £50, but you're selling at £8,500, the chances are that the regulator or someone else, I'm afraid, is going to intervene and say, that's, that, that's not right. And there is a fundamental problem here, which, again, we could talk about later if you want, but it's almost impossible within electricity to tell the difference between what one might call scarcity costs and um, ex exerting market power. Because almost by definition in electricity, as you get to the top of the load curve, there are very few plants in operation. So there isn't really a market, and it's always going to be possible as you go up the load curve for someone to exercise market power. And I don't think regulators have any clear way, and we've seen this across the EU where there's been any number of examinations of uh, competition in electricity markets and in the UK where Ofgem keeps looking at electricity markets and saying why were prices so high then. So fossil generators really have no way um, of being secure about investment, yet we need that plant, that flexible plant, to keep security. And that's why... The UK is currently talking about introducing a capacity payment. Ireland has had a capacity payment for some time, I think. A number of other countries, you can see from this map, are looking at capacity payments. So th the trend is towards capacity payments across Europe. They're all facing the same sort of problem. They're all facing the problem of remunerating fossil plant, the flexible plant they'll need to provide security. And they're all thinking about capacity payments. But there's a second problem, which I think people have not really paid so much attention to, but which is very important in the longer run, that renewables in this situation can't themselves be remunerated by the market either. Because when all the wind plants are operating together, you get low prices, so or zero prices. Um, in Spain, for instance, in March, there were 165 hours of zero prices, um, there was a weekend in May, I can't remember which weekend now, but when all the main European markets had negative prices, and some of them were down to minus 200 euros on that weekend. Um, these negative prices or zero prices, you can't have negative prices in Spain because of the way the rules work, but many other markets allow negative prices. These long periods of negative or zero or negative prices are, by definition, the times when you're getting most renewables output. Um, the theory on which apparently the Commission is operating is if you introduce high carbon taxes, then eventually uh, the renewables plant will be competitive in the sense that on a levelised cost basis, that is the cost per unit of output, the cost will be about the same as that of, uh, or lower than, that of the fossil plant with the carbon. But of course, that won't be true of the market price because the carbon price again, by definition, will only apply at the times when there's high demand but low supply from renewables. The whole purpose of the high carbon price is to ensure that high carbon intensive generation is used as little as possible, and therefore only at the time when there are no renewables. So the renewables plant will never benefit from that high carbon price. So there's a fundamental problem in the market structure. Um, at the moment, because they're mainly uh, remunerated by feed-in tariffs, um, renewables don't um, have either their investment or their operation signalled by market prices. 
It's difficult to see any way out of that as long as you have the, pre the same existing market structure. What you've got is what is technically called pecuniary externalities. Um, it's been described by the OECD as an increasing wedge between the costs of producing electricity and the price, prices on electricity markets. <coughs> prices and costs are coming out of sync and there's no exit strategy from that and it's due to the current market structure. And that's a problem with which Europe is struggling, not very successfully, to cope with, because, as I say, the Commission is focusing almost exclusively on its single market issues. And this is what was uh, said at the time of the European Council, that uh, Barroso wrote a letter to, um, to the uh, council members saying that the completion of a fully functioning market is central to Europe's competitiveness and must not be fragmented. Now, fragmented is a bit of Euro jargon, essentially saying we don't want capacity payments, despite the reasons I've given earlier why member states are doing that. They're focusing on their needs, which are security, which is understandable. Commission is focusing on its need, which is a single market, which is also understandable, but there's no meeting of minds there. They're saying this is what we want. Um, they're saying c capacity markets are likely to perpetuate the fragmentation of the European market. And this general negativity is, is, is continuing. They've, um, they're, trying, they're resisting the development of capacity markets. They've made clear they think they are negative. They've suggested a huge long list of criteria for introducing capacity mechanisms of the sort that would um, uh, inevitably delay any capacity mechanisms being introduced or at the very least add uncertainty as to whether they were going to be acceptable. Uh, they're proceeding with their target market. Now, I won't go into details about what it is, but it's basically a market um, which relies on energy only. Uh, the Commission's aim is to get a price, a single price per kilowatt hour ultimately across the whole of Europe in the same way that you have essentially for other markets. The oil market, you get so many dollars per barrel. They would like to have something similar with electricity. And so they're going ahead with that, with that design, pushing it as far as they can. Um, without really taking account of these other things, which they see as, as problems. In fact, basically, th they're working on a set of guidelines now to deal with the support for renewables, to deal with the, um, the general market issues. And mentally, the Commission, it is clear, thinks capacity payments are subsidies. It thinks they're anti-market not just because they make the internal market more difficult to develop, but because they are a sort of subsidy. Um, that the only way, in the same way that, say, you gave a, a, a fixed amount of money to an oil producer, that might be, a, and they still got the market price, that would be a subsidy. They, they, they see capacity payments as a sort of subsidy for security. So they don't see them as part of a market mechanism. They see it as an extra market mechanism purely designed to produce security. Their, their mindset is very different from that of member states who see it as part of the basic market and is paying for a service which is essentially a reliability service, which is a service that consumers value and something that they want. So there is a failure of meeting of minds of this and I think the, what's driving it within Europe is very much the competition directorate and their view of what makes a market um, and their view of how markets would, should be constructed. And it's slightly odd in a way because if you look at other markets, which I think most people accept are competitive, like, say, um, uh, broadband or telephony. Um, when, with most of those markets, you've got much more complicated pricing structures. You don't price just in terms of gigabytes or uh, minutes of phone calls. You have more complicated structures with fixed payments and um, access payments. And that's fully accepted. And no one says that's a subsidy in some way. Um, I think the problem with electricity arises because it's inevitable that the government has to be involved in some way with setting markets because of the monopoly aspects, the network aspects, the fact that you're selling all into a single market with a single operator. And that means that the Commission can't get out of the mindset of seeing these as effectively subsidies. So you've got in the Commission's latest sets of guidelines it's working on a slightly strange approach. On the one hand, it's trying to challenge a basic pricing and value element, which does make sense. It's treating that as a subsidy and saying that's the one we should attack. 
On the other hand, it's not doing anything about what is a market distortion, the pecuniary, pecuniary externalities I've mentioned. I mean, there is a real problem in the markets, but it's not the one they're addressing. They're addressing the wrong problem and not the problem that actually matters because, as I say, their concern is just about developing a single market. Um, they are trying to do something about the exit strategy, but it's in, a, it's in a strange way. It's by trying to get stronger market signals for renewables, for instance, by having feed-in premium rather than feed-in tariffs. But that doesn't address the basic problem. If the basic market prices are not giving you accurate signals about costs, are not giving you accurate signals uh, either to drive investment or to drive operation, what is the point of trying to link renewables prices closer to market prices? It still won't offer an exit strategy in the long run. Now, the Commission is, in its latest thinking, just assuming that will happen somehow automatically. When the carbon price is high enough, automatically all this will work. They're not really addressing the problem that if they leave the markets as they are, when they get very high carbon prices, the market will be saying all that renewables is excess. What you're doing essentially is dumping electricity on the market from those renewables which have been subsidised. How you would get out of that situation, I don't know. So just to draw it to a conclusion, um, I think the EU does face major <laughs> challenges in reconciling its energy and climate change objectives. Um, I don't really, as I say, blame them for not having succeeded in doing so so far. The problem is I don't think they're really making much progress towards doing it because they're not taking account of the changes in market structures which are underway at present uh, because of the uh, also EU objectives in terms of decarbonisation 2050 and so on. What they need to do is set clear priorities so it's clear what is driving this and how these different objectives can be reconciled. They have to find some way of matching targets and governance, and I don't know how that can be done. It may be something has to be done at member state level as well as something has to be done at EU level. But meanwhile, there's no real point in setting targets for which you have no governance, which you have no way of delivering. Um, and I think they need to do more to provide both clarity as to the direction of policy and robustness for the longer term. Otherwise, um, I'm not sure if I was being too much over the top in saying that I think it's coming apart at the seams. At the moment, there are very definite strains and no clear indication that anyone is trying to, to knit the two parts together. Thank you.